All right. So what are the teams again? Like the Chiefs and uh, 49ers. Cool. Not the 50 or it's the 49ers. Yeah. It's good stuff, man. And who's for the 49ers? Got some 49ers. Cool. And, uh, and who's for the other team? Yeah. Yeah. I already forgot who the other team is already. This is really bad. Well, I'm for the Bengals. I just want y'all to know. And we we gonna we about to do this. Yeah. We we about to do this thing right from the sideline. Yeah. We're gonna do this right here. Well, it's so good to see everyone this morning. We're we are in the I like how Marie said that the Galatians. Gal, we're in the Galatians. Uh Galatians, the book of God, Galatians. And we've been doing this now for the past couple of weeks, and uh, we're just honing in on just what is Paul talking about in Galatians, and uh, you know, just what is this book really all about. So this is what we're going to be talking about for the next couple of minutes, and uh, it's going to be really exciting. So if you have your Bibles, we told you, bring your Bibles. We're going to be walking through the Scriptures here, and we're in chapter, chapter 3 this week, so we're going to be walking through the Scriptures. So check out your Bibles, turn to chapter 3 of Galatians, and we're going to be uh, sort of playing around in that world. want to celebrate an addition to our church, Joseph and Jalisa, with our new baby over here. Yeah, <laughs> Joseph, you look so like alive and fresh and like, yeah, yeah, baby, baby ain't keeping me up. I'm a man. That's good stuff, man. Congratulations, guys. Way to go on that. You know, we need more people at our church. So all of you other parents, come on, get to work here. You know, yeah, that's good stuff. Future growth. All right. Good stuff. OK, so, hey, we're in Galatians here and um and here's what this series is really all about. This series is about learning what's, of course, in Galatians, okay? But this series is really about learning how to live a disciplined life, learning how to live a disciplined life. That's really the backdrop of this entire series. We're hoping that after the nine weeks of us walking through Galatians, that you're going to actually leave out of those nine weeks feeling more disciplined as you okay? Living a disciplined life means that I'm living within a path. Like I'm walking on a path and I'm not moving away from that path. I'm walking with sort of like a guide or, you know, uh, I, I practice certain kinds of disciplines. In other words, there are things that I just do in my life, okay? Um, I don't care what everyone else does, but there are there's things that I do in my life. Or um, everyone else may have a certain rhythm as to how they live their life. I have a certain rhythm as to how I live my life, okay? And so Galatians really paints a picture to a group of people that they need to really work hard on living a disciplined life. Now, here's the little trick of this whole deal is because this Galatians is also a book that talks about freedom. Okay. So um, in the Old Testament, let me go way back in the Old Testament. Of course, we see the creation of the world. Adam and Eve were created. And after they were created, they were free. The, the scriptures say that they were walking around butt naked, you know. And uh, that, I mean, you know, there was not like an emphasis on the butt naked. It's only emphasis on the butt naked because of what happened in chapter three. And so when what happened in chapter three was, of course, where the drop ball, where they made a mistake. They disobeyed God. And because of that the disobedience, this innocent thing that was innocent and no one really put emphasis and focus on now became something that they put emphasis and focus on. They realized that they were naked and they needed to clothe or cover themselves. So this innocent thing, this really simple, easy, simple, innocent thing that they never recognized was now recognized. They saw it. In other words, it's sort of like, uh, you know, us after we uh, get at a certain age like me, you know, I'm like realizing I'm putting on weight and I'm just like, man, why am I putting on so much weight? You know, so, you know, I like carrot cake. And so I go and piece of carrot cake and it's like, OK, I have to watch how much of this carrot cake I eat. I have to like eat it in doses. I can't eat it all at one time because it's, it just all wants to stick on me. And so that's what happened with them. Like they started to recognize their stuff when before they sin, there was no stuff for them to recognize they were they were perfect you know and even like not just perfect physically but mentally their minds were like perfect there it wasn't like seeing faults or you know mistakes or anything like that you know they were just good perfect people that's the way god created the world was perfect and then when they messed up this is when we began to have a broken world okay now 
God created his people. These people were the Israelites. And these individuals were individuals that God created um, a life journey with. And throughout the Old Testament, we see this sort of life journey where, you know, God was in love with his people. And the people were in love with God. And God had put in place certain kind of guidelines or laws, disciplines, things for them to do. I'm going to define them as walls that God created. He put these walls in place in order for his children to sort of live right and to live well. And these laws were what we define as just good disciplines um, for people to, to sort of stay in a right relationship. And that's exactly what was going on here. God had put in place things that he instilled in his people to say, hey, I want you to live by these things and do these things because I love you and I want the best for you. So just sort of stay right in line on doing these kinds of things. So you guys are going to meet people from other countries and other nations, and they're going to be living life and doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Their women are going to be living life and doing things that they shouldn't be doing. And I don't want you to marry those women because next thing you know, you're doing life like they do life. And so what God does is he puts in place a path and a way for them to stay in a right relationship and stay in a good relationship and stay well and stay healthy. And uh, they decided to knock the wall down and say, hey, you know, God, I don't want to live with, by those things. I want, to, I want to enjoy the kinds of things that are out there that other people are doing and other cultures are doing. And so they moved away from the ways that God would have them to live. And by doing it, they, they destroyed, damaged the relationship that they had with God. So God would punish them. And then they would hurt and be in all kinds of pain. And they would cry out to God. And then God would forgive them. And then they would fall back in love with God again. And then guess what they would do? They would see things that they would want to do again. And they would indulge in those things. And they would knock down the walls, the path that God would create for them. And then God would punish them. And they would cry out to God, oh, this hurts so much, God. And then God would forgive them. And then they would fall in love with This is the journey that actually existed between God and his people all throughout the Old Testament. God had put in place guidelines, ways for them to live, and it's called the law, okay? And so Jesus then comes to sing. And Jesus now comes not to destroy the law, law, but he comes to actually be a part of the law. He comes to show a different side of the law, all right? And this is a side of the law where he paints the picture of that you are free. I'm going to actually take on the burden of all of your condemnation, all of your mistakes, all of your convictions, like all of the wrong that you've done, I'm actually going to take it on. And I'm going to allow them to sacrifice my life so that you don't have to be condemned anymore when you break the law, when you mess up. And so, in other words, you're going to be free. Now, Paul is casting this message to this group of people, and he's telling them, you're going to be free. You don't have to do the Old Testament stuff anymore. So after Paul had already preached this message to them, he had gone off doing his thing to other areas, and Paul then returned, or he heard this word that uh, the Galatians church now were being uh, convinced by another group of people that, no, 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 you guys got to go back to the Old Testament. You've got to do the laws of Moses. And by not doing those laws, you're not in a relationship with God, a right relationship with God. So in other words, you must do these things in order to be in a right relationship with God. So Galatians is a letter written to a group of people encouraging them, challenging them to live a life of freedom because of Jesus Christ. Paul says that you are free because Christ has set you free. Here's what he says in uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 25. But now that faith has come, we are no longer guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God. Through faith, faith, faith is the other side of the picture that Paul is going to be painting here. We're going to be talking about that a lot today. For as many of you uh, as were baptized in Christ and have put on Christ, there is neither Jew or Greek nor slave. There is no male or female. You are all one under Christ. So Paul realizes that those in the Galatians church were following this new kind of thing that these other individuals were bringing. They were bringing, uh, they, we suspect that they were Judaizing kind of uh, believers because these were individuals who believed that we ought to follow the law and do the laws of Moses in order to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ. So Paul then writes the book of Galatians, and he writes a book where he is refuting 
a lot of the things that these Judaizing individuals were painting a picture of, of Paul. First of all, Paul addresses the fact that they're thinking that Paul is a fraud, that he's a fake, that these letters that he's, these, the information that he has taught them prior to was not good information, information that's, uh, that's fake, that this idea of Jesus Christ coming and sacrificing his life in order for you to be free and in order so that you are not lost anymore when you mess up or when you make a mistake, it's all, all rubbish. Paul addresses that in chapter one and chapter two. Paul gives a glance of two things, what a relationship with God looked like driven by laws of God and what a relationship uh, with God is that is driven by just faith in God. First of all, the laws in God prior to Christ, those in relationship with God were steered, led, directed, kept in relationship with God through following the law. That's what the relationship with God was all about, okay? So you would have to follow the Ten Commandments. You would have to uh, follow the laws that were put in place, the circumcision laws, the Sabbath day laws, the eating laws, the marriage laws, the all kinds of laws. You just had to follow all of them, all right? And then those who were in charge who found that you were breaking the laws, you were um, pretty much stoned to death. You had to die, you know? Couldn't live anymore because you broke a law, all right? So in other words, I must do these things in order to be embraced by God and to continue to stay in the, in the relationship, okay? So in Galatians chapter 4 and 10, Paul says, you observe days and months and seasons and years. He's like sort of laying out a challenge there, that that's what they did in the Old Testament. But Paul is painting a picture of a new kind of deal. He's trying to paint a picture of what a relationship with God looks like in the now driven by a love for God and having a faith in God, justification by faith, not by works. Because of life and death and resurrection of Jesus, we are free from laws and rituals. This is what Paul would say. And it keeps us in a right relationship with God. In other words, I don't have to do anything to receive God's love. I just have to believe. And that just is hard. That's hard, right? That's a hard one. Like, what do you mean I just have to believe? Dorian, almost anything that you do in this world You've got to do something in order to get something. And you're telling me, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to do anything. All I have to do is just believe. Yep, that's what Paul is saying here. Galatians 5.1, here's what he says. For freedom, Christ us free. I mean, completely free. Okay? Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to that yoke of slavery. What a yoke of bondage. So today, we're going to be talking about law, law, faith. Law or faith. And that's what we're dealing with here in Galatians. We're seeing law, a message of law, or we're seeing a message of faith. And we're in, again, in chapter 3, we're going to try to cover verses 1 through 14. I don't know how in the world Bob covered that entire chapter last week in 30 minutes. But I can do this. I only got 14, 14 verses. He had 20-something. Oh, my goodness. You know? Anyway, we'll see how I can do here. Paul builds a case for justification by faith and not works. He's doing here in chapter 3. In other words, our relationship with God is not defined by uh, wor works towards God, but our relationship with God is defined by faith in God. Faith in God. Paul begins by asking six questions. And so just roll with me here. We're just going to walk down the scriptures here, okay? Chapter 3. So he starts off by saying, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed or as crucified. So the Greek word here is nos or mine, meaning mine. In other words, he's saying you're not using your mind. You're foolish. You're not using one of the most emotional charges that uh, charged against in, uh, uh, addresses uh, that Paul addresses in his Pauline letters. I mean, like he's really heartfelt here. You know, he's referring to the mental incompetence of these Galatian people. It's like, guys, come on here. Use your mind. You're not using it. You're not, you're, you're lacking wisdom. You know, Paul may have chosen the word bewitched to uh, denigrate his opponents by casting them as magicians. So in other words, these individuals aren't even gospel driven kind of people. They're, they're not even holding on or holding true to even the Old Testament if they wanted to. These are individuals who are trying to, uh, you know, sort of, you know, get over on you in a sense. And they're putting whatever they can put out there in order to win you over. Now, again, one of the reasons why we're going through this book of Galatians is because many things that are happening in the book of Galatians are actually happening to us in our day and time today. Because these things, same kind of dynamics play out 
in our lives with individuals who consider themselves to be religious people, be spiritual people, Jesus spoke and, you know, but they're doing a lot of stuff and encouraging us to do a lot of stuff in order for us to count. Paul is seeking the identities of his agitators. Rather, he is commenting on the Galatians rejecting the freedom of Christ. It is as though someone has cast a spell on them, you know, and someone's getting over on them. Paul's question here is an appeal to the Galatians' own experience. In verse 2, he says, let me ask you only this. Did you receive the by works of the law or by hearing with faith? He's going back to the original, to chapter 1. You know, prior to chapter 1, he's saying, he originally talked about this. When you were convinced or when you gave your life to Christ, did you give your life because you did things? Did I ask you to do a list of things in order to be saved? Paul is like trying to get them to remember. Like you didn't have to do a lot of flips and jumps and a lot of volunteering in the, you know, in the church and all that kind of, that doesn't define you being in a relationship with God. You know, Paul reminds them that, hey, when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you accepted him freely without doing anything. When Paul presented his gospel message, the Galatians believed and received the Spirit without submitting to the agitator's instructions about circumcision, food laws, or calendar obs observances. So he's reminding them, you didn't have to do any of those kinds of things. Why are you doing it now? He says that you are so foolish. And then in verse 3, he says, having begun by the Spirit, are you being perfected by flesh. So he's now going to paint this picture that, hey, now that you are accepted by God, you're a child of God, you have a relationship with God, are you going to allow yourself to now have to do things in order to be in a relationship with God? Here's what he's saying. Are you seeking to be, to be made perfect with fleshly ordinances of the law? I mean, having begun your Christianity in the spirit, are you seeking after something higher still? the perfecting of your Christianity. I've seen this throughout the years in, in churches and even with Christians. Like It's like they're trying to grab for something up there. And they're just like, like I, can, I can reach it. I can get it. I just have to do more. I just have to be more. You know, you know we usually call those individuals who walk in the clouds with their feet on the ground, you know. And if you walk in the clouds, what's going to happen? You can't see, right? So more than likely, you are probably going to fall in that pothole that's <laughs> sitting right there in front of you. Paul would say, stop reaching. Stop trying to do things in order to become spiritually more mature. doesn't work like that. You know, The agitators might have told the Galatians that keeping the law would make them legitimate and mature believers. Don't forget, these were individuals who were watching a group of people Live a, live a certain relationship with God because of doing. They were watching the children of God, the Israelites, the Jews, live a certain life with God because of them doing all of the Moses laws. But Jesus came on the scene and he changed all of that. The Jews had a hard time receiving that. They were struggling with it. I mean, that's why so many of them didn't believe in Jesus at the time and still don't believe in Jesus now. Because they are so stuck on what they did in the norm, in the past of their lives. Jesus came and he did something totally different. And he totally changed the script on them. And he says, hey, guess what? You don't have to do those things anymore in order to be in relationship with me. And this was hard for people to accept. Verse 4, did you suffer so many things in if indeed it was in vain? Namely, the persecution uh, from Jews and from the unbelieving fellow countrymen incited by the Jews at the time of your conversion. So he's talking about what they had to go through. Don't forget, this was a group new to the gospel. Uh, when Jesus was you know, spreading the gospel and doing ministry, the Gentiles were not individuals that Jesus was doing his ministry to. They weren't the group of people that he was focused on. After Jesus left, it's then when Peter and Paul starts carrying the gospel to those groups of people. And, and explaining to them this freedom that was found in Jesus Christ. So now, come on, guys, you're welcome to come on in. But they're looking at it as, well, why ain't we doing the old stuff that y'all used to do? And Paul and Peter are like, well, we don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> it's changed. Well, well I got to be changed now that we're coming to be a part of it. Why y'all changing it all? Well, here's the deal. You don't want to do that old stuff. It's a lot of pain. A lot of cutting and all that stuff. 
so let's leave that alone. Dude, you guys were able to avoid a lot of those things. So here's the deal. You're free. You don't even have to do those things. You just got to believe in Jesus Christ. That's it. So this is the challenge that they're dealing with is, no, no, but y'all did it. Why can't we do it? Well, you don't have to do it anymore because Jesus came. Totally allowed you guys to avoid all of that stuff. Verse 5, which is the sixth question. Does he the spirit to you and works miracles among you? Do so by works or of the law or by hearing with faith. Paul's question sets up a contrast between law and faith be addressed further in chapters 3 and 4. I mean, he's really laying out this contention that exists within, within their world. And it's happening in, in, in the Gospels with these, with these guys. And you're either going to live by law or you're going to live by faith. We live life today. I mean, if you're going to try to live life trying to be perfect, I'm, I got news for you. You're going to fail. You're going to fail. I got to do a wedding this evening. And uh, usually when I do weddings, I usually, you know, encourage couples. I usually say these words. I would say, you know, uh, marriage is about taking the journey of learning how to love. I know you guys feel like you're all in love. I know you feel like you're doing it because, okay, cool. I love you, girl, and I'm going to do this with you the rest of my life. I'm ready to go. You know, and, and guy, I love you too. And it's like the biggest lie in the world because, you know, after you do that, in fact, it, like you go on honeymoon, you were thinking, well, like, wait till the honeymoon is over. On the honeymoon, y'all arguing. And y'all going at it on the honeymoon. You know, it's like, I thought this was supposed to be a good thing. This is not turning out that well so far. And when you look at the idea of love, which is the greatest love, which is agape love, right? The greatest agape love is with like mixed in there with like a cake. The ingredients of the agape love is patience and perseverance and compassion, forgiveness, love. I'm trying to learn how to love you. And so this is what's going on here. Like, like hey, here's the deal, man. You, you can live by the law or you can... Live by faith. And living by faith is you learning how to mix all of those ingredients together. Learning how to have patience. Learning how to have forgiveness. Learning how to journey with God and mess up and still being able to journey with God. Whoa. Yeah, you still count even when you mess up. Even when you struggle with whatever it is that you may be struggling with, you're still in the game. You don't get to check out. You can still play in the game. Okay, so Paul lays, he, he uses a character in this set of scriptures that are powerful and profound that helps to support his point in regards to faith. Faith, a relationship of faith with God. And this is powerful here, okay? And then he says this in, in, verse, in, in verse 6. He says, just as Abraham believed in God and it was counted to him righteousness, just as Abraham believed in God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. In this passage, he presents the model of true saving faith, Abraham. In doing so, Paul demonstrates that God has always justified people by faith, not works. Again, you remember when God called Abraham from his countrymen and, and from his dad, they weren't believing people. I mean, it was the Spirit of God that fell upon a Abraham that moved him. His name was originally Abram. And God gave him the name Abraham. And so, so God called him out from his people, and Abraham believed by faith, and he left. And he believed by faith, and he moved to every different position that God had called him to. Abraham didn't do nothing in order for God to bless him. Let's keep on going. We're going we're gonna to see that. In doing so, Paul demonstrates that God has always justified people by faith, not works. Paul then clarifies the role of the law in God's plan. It was intended to serve as a guardian until Christ came. Let me say that again. Paul then clarifies the role of the law in God's plan. Because one can wonder, well, what was the law for? What do we need the law for? I mean, if, if God wants, I mean, is he playing a game with us? No, he's not playing a game with us. I mean, it's just like a parent with kids. A parent with kids guide, provides guidelines, provides a path in order for our kids to live right, right? And boy, I remember back in the day when I was a kid, and my parents used to tell me, Doran, you need to just follow my ways. I, I know right. I know, I know the way. 
Just, just listen to me. Just obey. Like, Mom, Dad, y'all don't know nothing. Y'all, y'all don't know nothing. Y'all just, y'all just, y'all just, y'all just trying to put laws down on me and don't want me to do nothing. You don't want me to do nothing. And then I grew up and I realized, like, wow, they really did know best. And then I had kids and I was like, boy, they really did know best. <laughs> Daggone it. Same thing is happening to me, you know? And my kids are saying the same thing that I said way back then. You just don't want me to do nothing. No, I'm wise. I know better. Just listen to me. You know, yeah, you'll find out. Just give it time. Paul clarifies the role that the law, the, of God's plan as it pertains to the law. It was intended to serve as a guardian until Christ came. In other words, stay in this path. Don't move out of it. And I know things of the world seem very tempting. And feel like, man, I got to have it and I want it. In fact, like it tastes good. It feels good. I want it. Again, I use that very, uh, you know, you know, uh, easy, you know, elementary example. My carrot cake, you know, it's really good. And, and I mean, t- dude, it was like, like New Year's the other day. I mean, it was like, you know, 8.30 in the night, and I just felt like I needed a piece of carrot cake. And I told Janice, I said, Janice, I'm going out for a piece of carrot cake at that restaurant. And she says, no, that restaurant is closed. And I was like, no, I think I can do this. So she called the restaurant, and it was 8.50. And they said they closed at 9 o'clock. She said, Dora, you got 10 minutes. You can't get to Union Center. I was like, Janice, I can do the back streets, and I can. they'll stay open for me to give me my carrot cake. I didn't do it. I left it alone. <laughs> I went to bed in pain without that thing. You know? But I mean, it's like so good. Oh, my word. Now, that's carrot cake, okay? But we know it gets a little harder, right? We know that things become a lot, of hard, a lot harder. Television shows, politics, um, you know, alcohol and drugs and and not all of that stuff is, you know, individuals are guilty for. Individuals who have you know, major surgeries and health issues can, uh, can find themselves easily becoming addicted to, you know, pills and all that kind of stuff. It, it's hard, guys. It's hard. We can't just paint a big brush and just say everyone's guilty, everyone's wrong, who does wrong? No. This, this is a challenge of our flesh. And thank God he realized and saw this and he sent his son because we've got grace and forgiveness like, you know, like, hey, we're not going to be stoned when they catch us or when our stuff comes out. You know, in the church, we have done such a great job putting a cap, like, in other words, keeping things secretive. Like, no, we can't tell anyone because we're going to be judged or they're going to add us. Everyone's going to gossip about us. They're going to talk about us. That's what we do. That Old Testament way, like, no, we can't tell them. They're going to stone us. When we hurt alone, when we suffer alone, and we never let anyone join us in our stuff. Because we painted this picture that Jesus doesn't forgive. You know? And we got to stop that. Believing God refers to trusting that God will fulfill his promises. God had promised Abraham a here and, and countless descendants. Believing God refers to trusting that God will fulfill his promises. And that God will produce this this great group of people that he would bless, that would be in relationship to, to Abraham. This is what he said. Now, verse 7, now then, that it is those who are the sons of Abraham. 